I invite you over to the book of Thessalonians, the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're using this Lord's Day as a day of remembrance. Actually, going to call it Remembrance Sunday. I think it'll be the last Sunday of the year. My mind has sort of pedaled back the 2015 year and thought and praised the Lord. And I think about February, our marriage banquet. And Homes were strengthened. I think about March, our youth revival and souls were saved. And I think about April was Easter and Creation Sunday. And I think about May and Mother's Day and the largest crowd of mothers we had ever on Mother's Day. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Old-fashioned Sunday, can't forget that. Getting to ride a horse. You can't ever forget about riding a horse, even if you don't like riding horses. June is our 8th anniversary. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Just 8 years went by so fast. 4th of July service. and August was our gospel marathon. September the 11th, our military Sunday. October the, was our past appreciation month and was so kind. It still blows my mind to think how wonderful this church is to my wife and I. We just thank the Lord so much for how good you are to us. Uh, think about November, that all-night prayer meeting and our revival we had and how God met us there. And of course, our cantata for this December. and This is it. We're starting a new year. But this thought came to my mind, and I want to share a message with you this morning that God has laid on my heart in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. The Bible says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ and in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and of the Holy Ghost and much assurance, as you know what manner of men you were among you for your sake. And you become followers of us of the and of the Lord, receive, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. And we could get, go on, but I want to read again verse number 3, the very first three words of verse number 3. It says, remembering without ceasing. I want to preach a message to you this morning. Remembering without ceasing. If you've attended this church any length of time or any time at all or uh, many times, you've heard me at some time or some way, some measure of saying, I want to go forward. I desire to go forward. I desire to go forward not only in my Christian life, I desire to go forward in my church life, and I desire for this church to go forward. I don't have any desire to be stagnant. I don't have any desire to stand still. I don't have any desire to do something just to do something. Paul said it like this. He said, just beating the air. I don't want to just beat the air. I want to accomplish something with my life. I, I have just a, just a some few days, uh, just a measure of days, if you will. You know, your days are numbered. The book of Job, chapter 14, tells us that our days are numbered. I've just got a certain number of days. I don't know what those days are. You don't know what those days are, but you only have a certain number of them. And just like an hourglass with sand flowing through it, it's flowing as you're sitting here this morning. And so my desire is that we would move forward. I, I don't want to move, uh, uh, stand. I don't want to stand still, I want to move forward. Well, Paul is writing to this church in Thessalonians. And he's commending them for their growth. He's commending them that they're serving God. He's commending them that the whole gospel, the gospel is heard through the whole world. You'll read it here in just a minute. But he's commending this church. He's writing a letter. He's writing a letter. Notice what it says. He says, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm writing to the church. 
He's writing to you this morning. He's writing to me this morning. And He's desiring, and I'm desiring, and I'm trusting you're desiring is to move forward. Please, let's not get stagnant. Please, let's not get complacent. If you're complacent, please don't tell me because I don't want to get complacent. If you're discouraged, please don't tell me because I don't want to be discouraged. I want to move forward. I want to set my affections on things above and not things below. I want to move forward. I want to put my eyes on Him and I want to follow Him and I want to move toward Him. If you'll move toward Him, you'll go forward. One man said, even if you fall on your face, you'll be moving forward. Let's move forward. If we do anything, let's move forward. Let's not stand still. A part of moving forward is looking around and see where you've been. Why do you think businesses, why do you think uh, companies take inventory? Because they want to look back and see and count everything and make sure this is, is, this is what it is and we've sold this and we're going here, we're going there. Why do you take, think they take inventory? Because they want to move forward. They want to see how we can do more. They want to see how we can do this or do that. We want to move forward for God. I was out in the yard the other day, out here in the yard, and a guy drove by and he rolled down his window. I was out there by the driveway and he rolled down his window. He said, Preacher, when are you ever going to quit building? I said, when Jesus comes. That's why. I'm not going to stop. I don't want to stop. I want to build something. I want to do something. I want to move forward for God. I don't believe He saved us to sit down. I don't believe He saved us to, to stand still. I believe He made us to move. I believe He made us to function. He tells us here, Paul is writing and he says, Look, I'm glad you are a good church. You are doing something for God. You are working for Him. But notice this, verse 3 again. He says, remembering without ceasing. Don't stop remembering. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget of the things God has brought you through. Don't forget that God has done a great work in your past. By the way, we're to do something sometime. We're to just write down some of the accomplishments God has allowed us to have. I'm writing a documentary, and it's just just for my own benefit, just for my own uh, heart and mind, I guess. But it's not a book. It's a pamphlet of some sort. But it's it's just on my laptop. And from time to time, I'll get that program out, and I'll open it up, and I'll just type out some things that God has put on my heart to do. And I go back every once in a while and then I read that and I look at that like, man, I forgot all about that. I forgot that uh, God gave us this and I forgot that we were standing at an auction one time to buy some buses and a guy was handing me $100 bills to buy a bus. I I, I forget about some of that and I remember going here and going there and seeing God do this and seeing God do that and you forget sometimes. He told the children of Israel, when you leave Egypt and you go into a land that you did not build and you go to into a house that you did not build and you eat from a vineyard that you did not plant, do you need to be careful because you will forget. Lest you forget. This morning, I'm trusting that we'll do some remembering. He says, remember without ceasing. I wrote this quote down, things that grow always, always takes effort and energy. Anything that grows takes effort and energy. And I'll go a step further to say this, anything that has uh, growth has effort and energy, and it usually takes the efforts of many. You'll not find many things, if any, that grow by one person doing it. It'll never happen. It's not a one-man show. It's not a, uh, a dog and pony show around here that one does it all. You know, God designed the Christian life. God designed the church for it to all work together. Let me read Ephesians 4.16 to you. It says, The whole body fitly joined together, working in the measure of every part. Do you know you have a part in the work of God? I have a part in the work of God. God saved your soul not just to take you to heaven. He put you here to do a work, to do a service for Him. Fitly joined together. I love that fitly joined together. Uh, God made you, God designed you to put you in the body so you do a work for Him. I don't have a purpose. Wrong answer. Every massive building that you'd ever see. We were talking the other day about that big Tennessee bank down building downtown and all those windows. 
guy told me, he said, I was in that building the other day. I said, you ever seen a guy wash those windows? It's the most unusual thing. He scales from the top, and he'll swing in a big basket, and he'll wash every window. That big, gigantic, huge structure is made up of little bitty windows. Every structure you've ever been in, every building you've ever been a part of is a big building maybe, but it's always made up of little bitty components. Can I tell you, the church of the living God is the exact same way. There's one body, and it's made up of many different parts. But God designed for those parts to work together and move forward. Look at a car motor. A car motor fascinates me. How you can put a car motor together. You can put cam and pistons and lifters and valves and valve springs and, and all kinds of gaskets, and they all got to work together. Could you imagine uh, a, a valve wanting to say, I don't want to go up and down. And the lifter says, oh yeah, you will. God has to do that with the church, doesn't He? We don't want to do this. We don't want to do that. God says, I'm telling you that the work of God goes with many components. Moving forward, we must remember though, if we're going to move forward in 2016 as a church, we're going to have to remember what God has done for us. We're going to have to remember that He saved our hell-deserving soul. When we forget that He saved an old wrench like me, when we forget, we'll stop remembering, and when we stop remembering, we'll stop serving. We forget how good He is. Hold your place. I'm going to go over to Romans chapter 16. Would you flip over to Romans chapter 16? And I won't take time to do it, but if you start in verse number 1, and you go all the way to verse number 21, or 23 actually, if you'll read those verses, and I want you to turn over there because I want you to make note of it or write it down or see it somewhere where you can remember it, because you'll read verses 1 all the way to verse 23, and you'll read of 36 people that God talks about serving Him. The very first one, I'll read just a few verses here. Romans 16, Paul is writing to the Roman church and he says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is in Caesarea, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many. That's a, a helper or a worker. She's been a succorer or a helper of many and of myself. Paul writing, he says, I want you to... Get Phoebe. She's a servant of God. She serves the Lord. She's in the church. She's working. She's doing all kinds of things around the church and all kinds of things for people. And I want you to assist her. And you'll go on to read 36 people. Paul mentions how they're serving the Lord. I would to God that I could be in a list like that when God calls out the Twin City Baptist Church. He says, let me call out the Twin City Baptist Church and let me find out this guy's name and this lady's name. And I'd like to be in on that list, wouldn't you? I'd like to be in on the list that God write, reads off and says, let's see who's serving here at Twin City Baptist Church. Let's see who's doing something for me. And he rolls out his list. You know what? I want to be on that list. I desire to be on that list. I'm telling you what, when I got saved, I got saved 20, at 23, and I hadn't got over it, and I don't want to get over it, because if you get over it, you'll quit serving. Those that do not serve have forgotten that they were purged from their old sins, is what the Bible says. Why do people not want to serve? I think they don't want to serve because of the fear of the unknown. I think they don't want to conserve because of faith. Let me show it to you. Three things right out of the text. Verse number three, we get them all three right out of the text. Remembering without ceasing. Notice this, the very first one, your work of faith. Could you write that down somewhere? Just write down your work of faith. James 2.18 tells us, I will show thee my faith by my works. We're not saved by works but the world realizes we're saved by our works. See, God sees our faith. Man can't see our faith. You can't see how much faith I got. I can lay all my faith out in front of you, and you can't see it. God can see it. Man can't. But you can see my works. 
You can see what I do. You can see what I'm involved in. You can see what I give my life to. You can see my works. James says, show me your faith without works and I'll show you a dead faith. I'll show you something that no one else can see but God. He says here, a work of faith. He, notice he says in verse number 5, not in word only. He, he sort of backs up the idea that we've got to serve by faith. It's a work of faith. And by the way, you take out faith, you take out God. God has designed, maybe people don't like this, maybe people don't understand it. People don't want to serve God because it's by faith. I want to see it. I want to be able to put my hands around it. I want it to be a tangible something that I can put my hand on. Can I say you'll never serve? Because God said it's by faith. He said in Hebrews eleven six, 6, Without faith it is impossible. He didn't say you might could. He said you almost could. He said it is impossible to serve me, to please me without faith. That's the reason people don't want to serve the Lord. Because they can't see it. Remembering without ceasing. I want you to see this. I want you to dissect this verse because this is the message. Remembering without ceasing is always started with the work of faith. I remember we rented that storefront. Let me just say this. There's always a measure of uncertainty in faith. There's always, you'll write that down somewhere because you may come across some time. There's always a measure of uncertainty in living by faith. God designed it that way. Now you'll get God's direction, you'll get God's leading, you'll get God's peace on things He wants you to do, but there'll be times that you will not know absolutely 100% of a certainty, this is what I need to do. Why? Because it's by faith. Faith is the things not seen. I remember we started this church and we rented that storefront over there. I had God's leading. I had God's peace about it. I knew exactly this is what God wanted me to do. But when I shook that man's hand and said I would commit to $1,000 a month, I didn't have $1 to my name. Could I tell you, I walked away uncertain. I shook his hand and I thought, what in the world are we going to do? He don't know it, but I'm scared out of my mind. There's always going to be a measure of faith if you're going to serve God. There's always going to be a measure that you don't know fully. There's always going to be a measure of the unseen. There's always going to be a measure of the unknown if it's by faith. It's got to be. God says, that's when it pleases me is when you trust me. Matter of fact, you ought to write down Hebrews somewhere because if you're struggling with faith, and I'm not talking about saving faith. I'm talking about serving faith. I'm talking about serving God. You say, preacher, man, I'd love to serve. I'd love to get in on some of these, I, I, I call them uh, heavenly dividends. I, I call it uh, uh, stacking up dividends for the glory. If you're struggling with that and, and maybe never ventured into that or may have never wondered, man, I'd like to serve the Lord, but I, I think I'm just going to be a pew sitter. If you're settled right there, then I, that's just the Lord. He, he's going to deal with you. But if you really want to get in on the heavenly dividends, if you want to get in on uh, storing up some treasures in heaven, that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in storing up the things that the moth can't get to. I'm interested in storing up things that the rust can't corrupt. I'm interested in storing up some eternal things, not temporal things. Now, there's no doubt that we've got to have some e temporal things. We've got to have uh, some temporal things. But if we get our eyes on the temporal and not on the eternal, we're going to lose sight of it. That's what I'm trying to cause us to think about today. Hebrews 11, it says, Now the faith is the substance. Now, don't you notice this? It sort of a, sounds like contradictory if you don't really understand what it's saying. He says in Hebrews 11, 6, he says, Now faith is the, evidence, excuse me, is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, I read that and I had to read it again. He says the substance of things. Well, I thought it's something we couldn't see. When you live a true, bona fide, genuine faith in God, there'll be some substance to it. When you're living a true, bona fide, genuine faith in God, there'll be some evidences. God will see to it when you put your faith and trust in Him and serving Him, He will bring some evidences to you and you'll say, there ain't nobody can do this except God. 
There's some evidences. There's some substance to it. You're sitting in a substance today. Can I tell you, you're sitting in a substance of faith today. We signed a note, didn't have a dime to our name. You say, preacher, you crazy. You got to have a little crazy if you're going to serve God. He's looking for some crazies. Anybody want to be a crazy for Jesus today? That's what I told somebody the other day. I said, you know, people are just different. And I understand that. See, some people wouldn't buy a skyscraper if they had the money. I'd buy a skyscraper and didn't have the money. My brother used to tell me, he said, you're the only man that I know would go to California with no money in your pocket. I said, hey man, living on faith, brother. And I know that's some extreme, but I'm telling you, there's, there's an element of God's service that's the work of faith that will never come to evidence until you put Him to the test. God is desiring. God is, is love. He loves it when you put Him to the test. He even says it, try me. Try it and see. You'll be blown away. He says, for it is the evidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance. Go forward. I read this quote. I thought it was good. I wrote it down. To go forward and be effective. Now notice this. To go forward and be effective, it has to be by faith. Now I can go forward and it be by sight and be productive. But it might not be effective. Huge difference. See, I want to effect eternity. My desire is that you effect eternity. A genuine faith will always be a working faith. Faith is not something that you can put in a lockbox somewhere and store away. Faith will die. Some of, we, some of you ladies and some of you men probably can. And you put stuff in a jar and you seal it. And you're going to save it for the next year. You're going to save it for the time to come. Can I tell you, faith don't work that way. You will not be able to put faith in a jar, seal it, and put it away. It's a working faith. It's a moving faith. The man said this one time. Let me illustrate it this way. And I never thought about this, but it makes, it makes good sense. A lot of people got the idea when, when Moses rose his rod up in the air and the Red Sea parted. He said a lot of people get the idea that God opened the Red Sea from one end to the other. And he made this comment. He said when they were standing and saw the Egyptian army coming, they turned around and saw the Red Sea and God said, told Moses, raise your rod. He said, stand still and see the salvation of God. And he raised his rod. And I could just imagine when he said this, it made perfect sense. Just a little bit of the Red Sea opened up. Just enough to, just enough to get you into the Red Sea. And they stepped in. Opened up just a little bit more. Stepped in. Just a little bit more. I, I believe he's right on it. I don't believe God opened it up and just made it wide open and said, run through. I believe He said, the more you walk, the more I open. The more steps you take toward me, the more I open. You, but I don't understand. It's a little unseen. I don't know all that water. God said, just keep walking. Just keep walking. You walk a little further, get a little drier, and God just raised it back. You walk a little further, and before you know it, you turn around, and you've come a long way by faith. That's what God's saying. That's what pleases Him. God just wants you to trust Him. God just wants you to believe in Him. Faith is all... I love this statement. Notice this. You ought to write this one down. Faith is always based on... Excuse me. Faith is not based on what God is. Excuse me. I got it all mixed up. Faith is always based on God, who God is, not what God does. See, my faith in Him is based on who He is, not what He does. Because what He does will sometimes upset me. Can I be honest with you? I don't like everything God does. And that's just being human. That's just being honest. That's just being normal. But I have all the faith in who He is. Because He says what He does. And He does what He says. A real, genuine faith, work of faith, is believing God is who He says He is. Our Fellowship with Him is more important than the things He does for us. Notice the next thing. We say remembering, we're remembering without ceasing. The next thing. Notice it says it right out of the text. And labor of love. Labor of love. 
He goes on to say in verse number 5, what manner of man you are. What manner of man. He says it in verse number 5, as you know what manner of men we were. Can I tell you, the people that associate themselves with this church are to be people of manner of men. Well, they say, there's something different about them people. He says, as you know what manner of men you were among you for your sakes. They're labors of love. We are to be labors of love. He goes on to read in verse number 6, For you became followers of us. When you follow Jesus, when you follow Him, you'll be a labor of love. And let me say this, before we get the idea it's going to be easy, anytime you follow God, it's going to be labor. Why do you call Him, why does He call it labor? I, I don't see anywhere it's going to be easy. I see it's going to be labor. Notice he goes on to say in verse number 6, this labor of love. He says, you became followers of us, having received, notice this, having received, you've got something, the Word in much affliction. You've received something from God through much affliction. God no doubt handed us the Word of God. God no doubt gave us His own dear Son. There's no doubt God has done everything for us. And we murmur and complain that we got a little trouble. God says, much affliction. Here's what I want to show you in verse number 6. He says, much affliction. Notice He says the word with joy. Serving God doesn't make a lot of sense to the lost world. You mean I can go through a valley, I can go through heartache, I can go through difficulty and be a labor of love and have joy? That's what God said. That's the benefit of serving God. That's the benefit of the afflictions God's talking about. He says you can be a follower of me and have the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah 18, he says, The joy of the Lord is our strength. Where do you get your strength? You don't get it in circumstances. You don't get it in heartache. You don't get it in affliction. You get it in Him through those afflictions and those heartaches. How in the world can a man or a woman walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil? and come out smiling on the outside. It's because God is who He says He is. And He said, you serve me. You do a labor of love. I'll give you joy unspeakable and full of glory that the world knows nothing about. I'd rather serve God if I didn't go to heaven. I'm talking about just this, just this temporal work here, just this temporal life here. It's the best life. I guarantee you, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade what I used to be for three of what I got now. Even if there wasn't a heaven, even if there wasn't a Jesus, even if there wasn't a gospel, even if there wasn't any of that, I'd still want to be a Christian. I'd still want to be doing what I'm doing because of the joy that's in my heart. Psalm 51, 12, some of us need to say this verse, Psalm 51, 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. We'll read, uh, we'll study, but if you don't have the joy, it's a drudge. I'm telling you, it's terrible. The joy. See, it's one thing to do the will of God, but it's a far different one to delight in doing the will of God. How many of us have children? And we love it when our children do what we say, but they do it with an attitude. You might as well not even do it, are you? Yeah, I got it. I'll do it. Whoo. One. I, I, I don't count for them, I count for me. One, two, three, four, five. When I get to a hundred, then I can react. No, really. God has made the Christian life in such a way that it's a joyous journey. This walking around mully grubbing, this walking around with you with your pooch, your lip pooched out, and walk around telling how bad it is and how everything's bad and the world's weak. We all know that. Turn on the news. Where's the joy Jesus promised? Where is the joy that He put in the heart of His child? Where's the joy of knowing God? Where's the joy of serving the Lord? Where's the joy that He promised? It's the same place it's always been. In Him. That's where it's at. Some of the, I guess, joyous Christians they are are those that serve in God. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about uh, just going through the emotions. I'm talking about loving it. I've seen people on a bus route. Years ago, I've been in a bus route. I've been running a bus since I was, I got saved when I was 23. Right after I got saved, a month after I got saved, I was asked to do a bus route. I didn't know a thing about bus routes. 
But we would run a bus route. We got to Knoxville, and we would get on the bus. We'd get up at 5.30 in the morning on Sunday morning. We'd get to the church at 7 o'clock, and I'd run the bus from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. They'd go to church. I'd take another route. We'd take them home. We would, my wife and I, before we had kids, my wife and I would eat lunch about 3 o'clock. You say, man, I bet you was a wore out somebody. Yeah, but whoa, my heart was full of joy. Man, I was so content. Man, I was so glad, happy in Jesus. You said, you get tired? Yes, I went home and died. But there was something on the inside. There was something billowing out that I didn't fabricate, that I didn't concoct. I'm just trying to get you to see today, serving God is a work of faith and it's a labor of love. No one on the outside, I'm talking about unbelievers, no one on the outside is ever, I found this out, no one on the outside, unbelievers, are very ever really encouraged by prosperity. I, 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 I sort of evaluate people's lives. I just sort of look and I sort of, uh, in my own mind, just mentally think. And I have very, 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 very few times found people that are encouraging others with their prosperity. But I have found multiple people encouraging people through their afflictions. Read the book of Job. Would you know the book of Job, chapters 1 and chapters 2, is his prosperity? Chapters 3 through chapter 42 is his afflictions. And at the end of it, pricks my heart. I read it again, got convicted. The Bible says in Job 42.10, that God released the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Now that does something for me. That tells me Job had the joy of the Lord among afflictions. And God removed the captivity of Job when he let the joy spill out and he prayed for his friends. Job 42.10 I'm telling you, there's something about this labor of love, this work of faith, there's something to it, I promise you. I wouldn't be here. I, I, and I can say this with all honesty. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the joy of the Lord. If I didn't believe a mile deep in my heart that I wasn't doing something that affected eternity, I'd go home. I'd go fishing today. I'd pack my bags and I'd go hiking somewhere if I didn't believe what I'm doing is a labor of love. And I mean that. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great work. He said, but don't you notice this now? Remembering without ceasing. Don't forget. Notice this, the work of faith. Notice he says this, the labor of love. And the last one, right out of the text, the patience of hope. I said it a moment ago, people don't want to serve God typically because they don't see it. People don't serve God because they don't want to wait on it. I like one what preacher said. He'd been there like 40 years, pastoring the same church. He said, why? Somebody said about him quitting, leaving, going somewhere else. He said, why would I want to go somewhere else? He said, I've given my 40 years of my life. He said, I'm clipping coupons, man. What he was saying was, he gave his whole life. Why in the world would he walk out of that thing after he gave his whole life for it? That's what serving God's all about. Notice he says, and patience of hope in, that's huge, in our Lord Jesus Christ. See, my patience is in Him. This is a divine hope. This is a, this is a positive hope. This is a positive outlook toward the expected end. This is a positive hope. This is not a fretful hope. This is not, I hope it's going to work out. This is saying, I can't wait till it gets here, hope. This is the patience of hope. He said it in verse number 5, in much assurance. No one has to convince me, and I trust you, no one has to convince me that what I'm doing is for the labor of love and for the cause of Christ. No one has to convince me of that. God by His Spirit has convinced me that what I'm doing is a work of faith and a labor of love. It's the patience of hope. James 5.11 Is there works again? Matter of fact, let me say this. This is not a might hope so. This is a must hope so. 
That blessed hope, Ephesians tells us. It's a blessed hope. I'm not waiting frantically. I'm not waiting in panic mode. I'm waiting hoping. Psalm 25, 5 says, For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Psalm 27, 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. 21 more times, just in the book of Psalms, he says, Wait on the Lord. Preacher friend told me a while back he come through here. He said, you just need to wait on God. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Patience. Tribulation worketh patience. Don't play for patience. You'll get all kinds of tribulation. You say, I don't want all that. You're not going to get patience. Patience. Tribulation. It all works together. He says it again. And the patience of hope. And our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to turn to Psalm uh, Romans 2 and we're going to go home. Romans 2 and verse number 7. I want to leave you this verse. This verse says the message in a nutshell. Romans 2 7. To them, look at me, to them, to them. Romans 2 7. To them talking to you this morning, talking to myself, who, by patience, continuance, and well-doing, seek for glory, that's heaven, honor, and mortality, eternal life. You who continue, you who remember, serve. Remember without ceasing. The lifeblood of moving forward will be remembering without ceasing. That's the lifeblood of moving forward. Do you know why I'm excited about 2016? Do you know why I'm ready to jump off the deep end in 2016? It's because I can look back and for eight years I can lift my hands and say, God has been faithful. God has been faithful. God has been faithful. And if He has for eight years and He has for eight million years in the past, He'll be for eight million years in the future. Remembering without ceasing. I want to serve Him. I want you to serve Him. I believe God's called me to stir you up to serve Him. What kind, of, what kind of basketball player would want a coach that didn't teach him how to play basketball? What kind of football coach or football player would have a football coach that didn't want to help him play better? What kind of church would want a pastor that didn't want to stir him up? I wouldn't want to be a part of one. Really, if you don't make me mad a little bit from time to time, we ain't going nowhere, are we? If I don't rub you raw a little bit sometimes, you ain't going nowhere, are you? I'm not being intentionally. I'm not talking about ugly. I'm talking about stirring it up. I'm talking about shaking the basket. You come over here today with some friction. Maybe at home, I guess, baby, but your car motor had friction in it. That's how you got here. Friction moves things. Stir things up. Somebody asked me the other day, he said, we can't ever forget what you're going to do. I said, amen. Amen. Hey, I'm harder to hit when I'm moving. You send an old coyote or an old deer or something, they're moving, and you say, stop it! Well, I can hit you. See, I'm an easier target when you're standing still. It's a harder target to hit from the devil when you're moving. That's what I desire. You say, preacher, where are you taking us? I'm taking you on the work of faith. And when we see Him, we'll be glad. Dr. Lee Robertson, 40 years in the ministry, and on his deathbed, they said, Dr. Robertson, if you had your life to live over again, what would you do? He said, I'd attempt more for God. I mean, that man has done more than most preachers will ever even think about doing. And he said, I'll, I would attempt more for God.